Извините, мой доклад будет на английском языке. На протяжении всей пандемии я почти не говорил по-русски, кажется, и сейчас мой разговорный язык ужасно, как сказать, ржавый. Поэтому я буду на английском. Спасибо. Вот. Okay, anyone with an interest in the history of philology ultimately ends up discussing Indology, the study of the history and cultures, languages and literature of the Indian subcontinent. The early Soviet Union was no exception and the field here developed in opposition to trends developed in the UK, France and Germany, not least since it was dealing with the most important colony of the most powerful imperial power of the period. By the time of the revolution, a significant form of Indian, of, of um, Russian Leningrad Indology, centered on the work of Sergei Oldenburg and Fyodor Shubatskoy, uh, had developed centered not on Vedic myths and traditions as found in, bo uh, in both, uh, as the foundational for both Indian and European cultures, but on Mahayana Buddhism as a philosophical system that rivaled the achievements of ancient Greek philosophy. While progressive in many respects, the focus was on Sanskritized Buddhism rather than the various Prakrits or modern Indian languages of India. Thus, in a 1919 essay on Indian literature, Oldenburg maintained that Sanskrit literature is the basis and essence of all Indian literature and that modern Indian literature uh, provides but a pale glimpse of the beauty of ancient India. The focus began to shift in the early 1920s, especially in the work of Mikhail Tubiansky and Alexei Baranikov, who introduced the teaching of modern Bengali, Marathi and Hindi at the Institute of Living Oriental Languages in Leningrad. In the 1920s, Tubiansky, for some time a member of what we now call the Bakhtin Circle, became the USSR's most uh, uh, foremost authority on the work of um, the Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore, while Baranikov pursued bath-breaking work on the changes in the Russian language after the revolution, and then the language and ethnology of Roma communities in the USSR. He traced the origin of Soviet Roma in the untouchables of ancient India, considered how their languages and cultures had been affected by years of oppression in the diaspora and worked to codify a written language for the Soviet uh, Tsigani. When the Stalin regime moved to close down uh, uh, Tsiganovidinia uh, in the um, second half of the 1930s, and just as many of the older Indologists uh, were caught up in the Great Purge, Baranikov emerged as the leading advocate of modern Indian philology in the USSR, establishing the modern Indian office, the Nobindiski Kabinet, at the uh, Institute Vostokovidinia in, in Leningrad. For all its limitations and uh, the marks of the time, Baranikov's work is worth a new look today, I think, because it offers a more sophisticated understanding of the relationship between colonial and indigenous intellectuals in the uh, emergence of Indology than one finds in many, so we say, Foucault-inspired forms of post-colonial studies today. And it anticipates some of the latest trends emerging in what's now called Dalit studies, uh, which is a, a, an important trend in Indian intellectual life now. There are important reasons for this that I'll hardly touch on today, but these include the in influence of Nikolai Ma's critique of Indo-Europeanism, as entwined with the project of European colonialism on post-colonial intellectuals, and the visit of anti-caste intellectuals such as uh, Rahul Sankritjayan, perhaps best known in Russia for his uh, novel from the, um, uh, from the Volga to the Ganges, uh, and Dharman and Kasambi, uh, who uh, both of them came to Leningrad in the late 1920s and then again in the 1930s.
as well as developing the study and teaching of modern Indian languages, Baranikov developed some important work on, the, on modern Indian literature, particularly focused on the Awadi dialect of the Vaishnava poet Tulsidas, and on the writer most commonly regarded as the author of the first work in modern literary Hindi, Lalo Lal. Baranikov argued that the neglect of such works resulted from the connection of ancient Indian language and medieval Sanskrit with comparative linguistics, i.e. Indo-European philology. British government support for research in these areas and the absence of such research for, support for research into the field of modern Indian philology. Um, traditional Brahmin, Brahminical hostility towards heretical literature in modern languages and most importantly, India's colonial position, for it was only the rise of the national liberation movement that raised the profile of such work. Branikov argued that the uh, Indo-European philology was not simply an ideology that was imposed onto the Orient by an imperial power, but that it arose when colonial philologists adopted paradigms that had already been developed by Brahmins in pre-colonial India. Pandits schooled in literary work of grammarians such as Panini uh, presented Sanskrit as the original literary language of India and Middle Indian Prakrits and modern Indian languages as but tainted dialects of that standard. The grammarians had in fact codified a scholastic version of Sanskrit in an effort to combat and challenge the challenge to Brahminical authority by Buddhists and Vaishnavites who were writing in the vernacular. Prakrits and by extension Buddhism and other non-Brahminical creeds indigenous to, to, indigenous to India that made use of those forms were regarded as tainted dialects of what became known as Hinduism. While in full contradiction with the historical facts, as Baranikov put it, European philologists accepted this narrative and reinforced it with the racist conclusions from their Indo-European theory. And here we can see the influence of Ma clearly on, on, on Baranikov at this time. According to this theory, the British being Western Aryans had ended Mughal rule and in so doing had restored historical justice. Until the creative part of the population of India, i.e. the Aryan Brahmins, could recover from the Mughal yoke, the British had a responsibility to manage India which it did supposedly according to ancient traditions. And these traditions were allegedly embodied in Brahminical texts, such as the laws of Manu, which guided by pandits, philologists translated into European languages. But turning to literature, Baranikov focused on the connections between the rise of literature in the vernacular and the so-called Bhakti movement, which reached its zenith in North India in the 15th to the 17th centuries. Central to this were the multiple legends concerning the figure of Ram and Krishna as avatars of Vishnu, so Vishnu and Vaishnavism uh, comes from this. Insisting on the individual path to spirituality regardless of birth, status or gender, the Bhakti movement found expression in the work of a number of poets who adopted a variety of philosophies and critical perspectives on, on Brahminism. The most ardently anti-Brahminical were the Hindi poet Kabir, who also inspired the founder of Sikhism, Guru Nanak, and the Marathi poet Tukaram, both of whom suffered persecution for their works. Rather than the work of these caste-focused figures, however, it was the Ramcharit Manas, or the Lake of the Deeds of Ram, Tulsidas's retelling of Sanskrit Ramayana of, uh, of Valmiki, that was in, uh, written originally in, in Sanskrit, that um, Baranikov regarded as the greatest work of Indian literature of the Middle Ages. And this greatness allegedly lay in Tulsidas's ability to anticipate one of the key features of socialist realism, which was by the mid 1930s, of course, being considered as the criterion of progressive literature, the commitment to accessibility and its focus on the people, on the narod, narodnost. Though a Brahmin, 
Tulsidas protested against the self-isolation of Brahminism and in order consciously to transcend its limitations chose to write in the vernacular rather than Sanskrit, not for the Brahmins but for the Narod. Baranikov uh, explains this in connection with Tulsidas's orthodox uh, Vishnavism, according to which before Ram there is no high and low. And while Vishnavism had this democratic tendency in that it accepted representatives of all castes, those who had lost their castes and even Muslims, Tulsida subordinated this to a traditional orthodox position that supported the principle of the four varna or the four castes, with Brahmins at the top and the Shudra at the bottom. Um, this evident contradiction, Baranikov explained, uh, by the overarching need for national unity in the face of imperial aggression. The supreme divinity of Vishnu and his incarnation, Ram, is but an image in which India's striving for unity was reflected, which demanded its vital interests. Thus, while Tulsidas gave a voice to opponents of Brahminism, this was subordinated to the patriotic aims to show the people how to save the country and its culture, in the time of terrible struggle with conquerors. So despite his contradictory outlook, Tulsidas was able to present a clear uh, uh, picture of contemporary life along with the complexities of the social structure. So here we can see the way in which Baranikov's considerable insights into the role of Indo-European philology as a product of actual collaboration between Brahminical pandits and colonial philologists. The important ideological role this played and the exploration of the caste dynamics of language and literature in northern India are enclosed within a Stalinist narrative of national liberation, the leadership of which has to fall to the progressive elite. India's striving for unity is projected back into the Mughal period, while the progressive role of Brahmins oriented on the Narod, as opposed to those obsessed with their clerical trappings and feudal status, is uh, emphasized. Similarly, Tulsidas' superiority to militantly anti-Brahminism uh, anti of Kabir and Tukaram resides in his recognition of Brahminical hegemony in the liberation struggle. But more interesting, I think, than these evident accommodations to the rigid stadialism of Stalinist historiography, is the way in which this is correlated with semantic, semantic paleontology. In accordance with the ideas developed in Marist folklore and literary studies, Baranikov presents the legend of Ram as a series of semantic clusters that have remained constant, but the internal significance of which has changed according to the changes in material culture and social structure. While not directly invoking Marist thinkers, he isolates numerous semantic series inherited from tradition and illustrates the way in which Tulsidas breathes new life into new into old images, revealing new aspects in the formation of comparisons. The significance of this is more pronounced in Baranikov's 1937 discussion of the figure of Krishna as pronounced as portrayed in Lalulal's Prem Sagar, the, the Ocean of Love of 1810. This text was particularly conducive to paleontological analysis because it's a retelling of the legend of Krishna that appears in the Mahabharata, probably composed sometime between the third century BCE and the third century CE, um, elaborated in the 10th book of the Bhagavata Purana, uh, which is around 800 to 1000 CE, both of which were written in Sanskrit but were then retold in a number of North Indian dialects before Lalu Lal rendered it in Sanskritized Hindi for a very different audience. In a lecture at the Academy of Sciences in 1935, Baranikov drew, draws upon the uh, work of Bandaka and Silvan Levy to argue that Krishna is of folkloric origin uh, originated among the nomadic Abir tribe of northwestern India, and that in the Bhagavata Purana, um, Brahmins had transformed the, uh, the image of um, Krishna as the shepherd god into a shepherd god prince. 
drawing on the vernacular rendering of the legend in the 15th century Vaishnava poet uh, Mishra, uh, Lalu Lal stripped away the protracted dialogues on philosophical and religious themes found in the Bhagavata Purana, uh, placed Krishna more firmly into a low caste milieu, including considerably more detail about peasant life and, and uh, festivities. Moreover, he argues that the two parts of the text don't cohere easily in a number of ways, suggesting each relates to different textual layers pertaining to different times and created by representatives of different castes. The first part of Prem Sagar is a pastoral in which Krishna belongs to a very different social milieu than the higher Brahmin caste that created traditional morals. Krishna is here a dark-skinned shepherd, which is why often Krishna is, is portrayed visually as actually blue, um, whose sympathy lies with the shepherds and with the low castes in general. He's a rebel, a constant advocate of the law of his caste and the caste religion. He wages a consistent struggle with the representatives of traditional Brahminical pantheon. He defeats all the gods and proclaims the law of Vishnu. Krishna's is a radical natural religion and his struggle with Shiva, the cult of whom attracted mainly representatives of uh, what Baranikovs calls the aristocratic castes, pro proves to be particularly fierce. So in the second part, we have a religious quasi-historical novel in which Krishna is pure Kshastriya or the warrior caste acting in union with Brahminism. And here he reaches a compromise with Shiva, declares, that henceforth all members of the uh, triad Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu are recognized uh, uh, but all three, uh, as but all three of, uh, of a single divine being. And this Brahminical reworking characteristic of the Puranas, the uh, narrative of which in its original form was created by non-Brahmin castes, Krishna's anti-orthodox words and deeds in the pastoral part are reconciled with orthodoxy by making them purely uh, symbolic. Krishna, the shepherd, is now divine being whose deeds belong to the other world, and in mechanical fashion, he's meant to he's made to recite hymns from the Vedas in uh, defense of Brahmanism. So the contradiction within the text is particularly evident in uh, Prem Sagar because it was. Uh, because though a Brahmin, Lalu Lal was not seeking to reaffirm traditional Brahminical privilege, but was working according to a more modern proto-nationalist agenda. The parallel traditions of scholastic Sanskrit and vernacular literature in verse, characteristic of the era of Tulsidas, had been irreversibly destroyed by the advent of British domination, and the new Hindi literature arose along with the new economic and political conditions. Baranikov explains that uh, Lalu Lal played an important role in the formation of this new Hindi prose, liberating it from archaic verse styles in forms typical of European literature. His synthesis of the old literature tradition with new literary forms was completed only in the 20th century, though, he argues, uh, with the consolidation of the nationalist movement and with figures like the novelist Prem Chand. Uh, who died in 1936, um, the first president of the anti-imperialist progressive writers movement, who also sought to cleanse Hindi of its Sanskritisms that distanced the literary forms from the popular language. So Prem Sagar becomes this kind of transitional text. It still has Sanskritisms, uh, but nevertheless written in uh, what is a recognizably modern Hindi. Um, well, there was a significant threshold that intervenes between the time of Lalo Lal and Prem Chand, and that was the 19, 1857 Sepoy Mutiny, about which, of course, is a famous article by Dob Dobra Lubov. And the final liquidation of the Mughal Empire, which led to a radical restructuring of the economy and social interaction. Now Persian lost its position as an important language of trade and knowledge of, Eng and knowledge of English becomes a precondition for success in administrative and commercial life. There was now an unambiguous fall of Sanskrit culture, as Baranikov puts it, and the simultaneous spread of English and capitalist culture um, as the inter, uh, Indian intelligentsia in all provinces was forced to learn the English language 
even though it was viewed as an enemy that obstructs the working out of a common language in India. Um, and this emergence of, uh, is it, this is all to be explained, not by recourse to the idea of any related Indo-European languages, but the entry of the bearers of corresponding languages into a single economic system. Now, Branikov died in 1952. His reputation was affected quite seriously by Stalin's attack on Marism in June 1950, after which a return to traditional forms of positivist scholarship was mandated, leading to considerable nostalgia about pre-revolutionary uh, pre philology and Oriental studies. After Indian independence, led by Brahminical forces who dominated, also dominated the Indian Communist Party, um, the formation of the non-aligned movement after the 1955 Bandung Conference, um, Baranikov's highlighting of caste divisions of Indian literature and Indian culture was out of step with official Soviet policy. Now, once again, Sanskrit literature becomes presented as the foundation of all uh, Indian literary process that accompanied the formation of, India, of the Indian state. It was only actually in the 1990s that the anti-caste movement in India becomes an object of study in any systematic case in, uh, in uh, Russian scholarship. Now, as with many intellectuals who maintained a successful career during the Stalin period, Baranikov's legacy needs serious reassessment. There's little doubt that the destruction of the Leningrad School of Budology represented a significant loss to scholarship, and Baranikov acknowledges as much in his work. The rift between the objects of the old and the new Indology had damaging effects on the field in general. And there were effects of, but these were the effects of various conjunctural factors that shaped the field. The recognition of which I think is important for us to begin to distinguish the aspects of Stalin era, in, Stalin era Indology that have real and lasting values. I'm not competent to comment on Baranikov's many contributions to the study of Hindi or Urdu grammar, but his application of the categories of early Soviet sociolinguistics to North Indian languages was undoubtedly a significant achievement. Not only was he able to correlate linguistic and social history, but also able to highlight the ideological factors at work in the formation of standard languages and disciplines with which they're connected. Another achievement is the consolidation and extension of the critique of European Indology and comparative philology in such a way that it was revealed as a collaborative enterprise between indigenous and colonial elites. It wasn't until that the rise of Dalit studies in India in the 1990s that the dichotomy between colonial and indigenous in ideology and scholarship is overcome in any significant sense even if there were some important moves in that direction in the work of earlier Dalit intellectuals. Whatever the achievements of post-colonial and subaltern studies in um, focusing attention on cultural effects of colonial domination, and they're considerable, this trend remained unable to escape pre-existing binaries, even while they were re-evaluated. And I think Baranikov's work has an important role to play in helping us move that direction forward. Similarly, the uh, focus on the rise of vernacular Indian literature and its dynamic engagement, both with the oral and folkloric traditions of the masses and with the Brahminical tradition of literature in Sanskrit was a significant advance. What we now call Hinduism, and this is uh, the history of this term in itself is a rather interesting one, is revealed to be a, a sociologically and ideologically diverse sphere in which social and ideological struggles took place before attempts to present a coherent doctrine emerged with the rise of bourgeois intellectuals in the 19th century. Significant Indian Marxist intellect, uh, historians such as D.D. Kasambi, who was the uh, son of Dharmanan Kasambi, uh, Sharma, who had uh, considerable respect for uh, Baranikov's work, and Irfan Habib, would develop this further, as would the prominent historian of ancient India, Ramila Tapa. Clearly, these historians had much more direct access to primary materials than did Baranikov, but their work is interestingly quite close in accordance with that of Baranikov himself, who wrote in much less advantageous conditions and was never able to go to India. So as such, then, in conclusion, Baranikov's work appears 
an important point of reference, I think, in Oriental studies uh, today, especially at a time when Indian history is once again being distorted and mythologized. This time in the government's drive to uh, create a discriminatory ethnocratic state based on Hindu chauvinism. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.